Timur the Lame, one of history's most brutal and unforgiving conquerors, is devising his next grand strategy. The checkered table in front of him offers no answer to the nomadic warlord. A few moments pass before he finally remembers the lateral strategy he had learned from his campaigns in Persia. But just as his hand touches the two pieces lined in front of him, a servant rushes into the room and hurriedly informs Timur that one of his wives had just given birth to a son. Without hesitation, Timur declared that the child be named after the next chess move he was about to make, Shah Rukh, or King Rukh. Better known as castling, this unique chess move features the king and Rukh swapping places. How coincidentally true this spur-of-the-moment name would prove to be for Timur and his fourth-born son. It was almost as if it was prophecy that Shah Rukh against all odds and even himself at times, became the inheritor of the Timurid Empire. Shah Rukh was born on August 20th of 1377 in the Timurid capital city of Samarkand. His mother's origins are up for debate, but many historians point to one of Timur's Tajik concubines. Regardless of his maternal origins, he would be raised by Timur's chief queen, Sarai Khanum. Shah Rukh would spend the next 20 years either in Samarkand or joining his father and brothers on campaign. These three brothers from oldest to youngest were Umar Shaikh Mirza, Jahangir Mirza, who died a year before Shah Rukh was born, and finally, Mirhan Shah. All four brothers had different mothers, none of which included Queen Sarai Khanum muddling any plans for a future succession. When Shah Rukh was only 11, he was married off to the daughter of one of Timur's most steadfast nobles. Her name was Gowar Shatnand. Their marriage, although arranged, would be filled with nothing but love. Shah Rukh found one of his greatest advisors in his wife, and she would prove to be indispensable for the empire. In 1394, Shah Rukh would move one step closer to the Timurid throne, when his older brother, Umar Mirza, died on his way to Samarkand. Prince Umar had been the governor of the recently conquered and still rowdy Fars province. While passing a rebel-controlled fort, a single arrow fell from the sky. It landed directly in the neck of Umar, who fell from his horse and bled out within moments. When Shah Rukh turned 20, he was finally granted his long-overdue post as governor. He would overwatch Khorasan, one of the most vital junctions in the empire, for it connected the steppe capital of Samarkand to the salty waves of the Caspian Sea. Although this seat of power was a prestigious one, it was also one that his brother Mirhan Shah held when he was only 13 years old. The relationship between father and son was never a bad one, but it was never recorded as a particularly fond one. Perhaps after the death of Jahangir and the birth of Shah Rukh in such a short time, made the fearless Timur scared to get attached. He was an emotional man, despite massacring millions. This strange relationship could also be explained by Shah Rukh's own fondness for Islam. While Timur was the self-proclaimed protector of the faith, he did not take the religious as seriously as Shah Rukh did, for the traditions of the steppe were still firmly embedded in him. One area where Timur enjoyed seeing Shah Rukh the most was the battlefield. The Timurid prince frequently joined Timur on campaign and, more often than not, held command on one of either flank. In 1402, Shah Rukh's medal would be tested on the biggest stage, the Fields of Ankara. During this pivotal battle, Shah Rukh held his flank despite a corps of Serbian knights led by their prince, Stefan Lazarevich. Together, the Timurids defeated the Ottomans and captured their ruler, Sultan Bayezid. With his greatest conquest behind him, Timur attempted to top it. In 1405, he left Samarkand for the Far East. His destination was China, and all the wealth that came along with it. Shortly after leaving, the 68-year-old conqueror grew gravely ill. 
The always moving Timurid army came to an abrupt standstill. It soon became clear that Timur the Lame was dying. As he laid in agony, he had repeatedly but one wish. I have no other desire than to see Shah Rukh once more. This last wish would never come true. Timur died on February 18th, 1405. This wish to see his fourth-born and chronically overlooked son is a thing of mystery. Maybe it was a later invention by Shah Rukh, or maybe Timur could see the future that laid ahead of him. What followed Tamerlane's death would be a succession dispute unlike any other. He failed to provide his empire with any designated heir, meaning it would be a contest of arms to see which son or grandson came out on top. Shah Rukh, stationed as the governor of Herat, was far from the Timurid crown lands around Samarkand. Regardless, he made his bid for the throne and declared himself both Sultan and Shah. Where Timur was only an emir, Shah Rukh styled himself as a true ruler. His domain during these early days comprised of western Afghanistan and most of the north and central parts of Iran. The most legitimate of Timur's heirs by blood was his eldest grandson to his eldest son, Pir Muhammad. Pir Muhammad had previously been disgraced on two separate occasions by Timur himself. Although he made up for it in India, displeasing the emir would have long-lasting impacts on his legitimacy. He rose claiming the throne just as Shah Rukh had, but no one, not even his own brother, supported him. To make matters worse, he was even farther from Samarkand than Shah Rukh and completely cut off from him. To preserve his own life, he pledged himself to his uncle, Shah Rukh. This in turn lended Shah Rukh the legitimacy that he lacked. The most obvious claimant for the Timurid throne was nervously in his corner of the board. While Shah Rukh may have had the most land during the opening phases of the Civil War, he did not own the city that tied it all together. In Samarkand, the once small steppe outpost had become the centerpiece of a massive and now splintering empire. It fell to an unexpected descendant of the emir, another of his grandsons, this one being the son of Timur's only other living son, Mirhan Shah. Khalil was the second favorite of Timur's many grandchildren, most notably overshining Pir Muhammad in India. Timur even granted him the governorship of the fertile Fergana Valley, only a stone's throw away from Samarkand. Upon learning of his grandfather's death, Khalil won the race to Samarkand and took the city without opposition. He declared himself Sultan Khalil. Hot on his heels was another experienced grandson of Timur. While all previously discussed grandchildren have been sons of Timur's sons, Hussein was a son of one of Timur's many daughters. He took 1,000 loyal followers and marched on Samarkand to press his unlikely claim on the throne. The now Sultan Khalil had barely won the race. Seeing that he had firm control over the city, Hussein pledged himself to his cousin's throne. While Khalil claimed the throne, his father was busy in his own corner of the Timurid Empire. In the east, he governed a realm centered around modern-day Azerbaijan. Mirhan Shah, although positioned with a sizable army, had a long road ahead of him if he was going to reach Samarkand. Not only did the descendants of Timur carve up his once mighty empire, but so too did his enemies. The most persistent of Timur's rivals was a man named Ahmad Jaliyir. Timur had conquered and reconquered his lands four times over before he finally gave up. But when Timur died, he decided to fare his chances with his descendants. When the Mamluk Sultan learned of Timur's demise, he sent Ahmad Jaliyir along with another old Timurid rival, Kara Yusuf of the Black Sheep Turkoman, also known as the Kara Kanulu. During Timur's initial invasion of Iran, Ahmad Jaliyir and Kara Yusuf had allied against Tamerlane, to no avail. Although their countries no longer existed, their alliance remained active as they marched to reclaim. With the board set, it was time to play a game of thrones. 
Shah Rukh, as his namesake might suggest, waited, patient and still to make his move. He didn't have Samarkand, but neither was Samarkand positioned to challenge him, especially since Mirhan Shah had failed to return from the east. Ahmad Jalir and Kara Yusuf pushed deep into Mesopotamia and started taking Mirhan Shah's own lands in Azerbaijan. Now, in a two-front war, he was forced to stay back and hold off the once conquered. While Ahmad Jalir was no more than a pushover, Kara Yusuf, this time around, would prove to be all they both needed. In 1406, the Black Sheep Turkomans defeated a Timurid army led by another of Mirhan Shah's sons. This guaranteed the existence of a revived Jalirid and Kara Kanulu state. It also prevented any chance for Mirhan Shah to help his son in Samarkand. Negotiations between Shah Rukh and his nephew had been ongoing since Timur's death. So far, there had been no progress. Soon enough, Sultan Khalil invaded Shah Rukh's lands. Neither proved as competent on the battlefield as the man they were attempting to replace. No matter how long they campaigned against each other, there was never a conclusive engagement and neither came close to besieging their opponent's stronghold. They would continue having on and off battles throughout their dual reign. In 1405, likely while Khalil was absent from Samarkand, another claimant to the Timurid throne attempted to seize the crown. Hussein, who had pledged his loyalty to Sultan Khalil in that same pivotal year. This would be stomped out in no time. Hussein would be executed, ending his own dynasty that had originated on the Mongolian steppe nearly 250 years ago. But his journey did not end there. His decapitated head would be stuffed with straw and sent to the doorstep of Pir Muhammad. A warning and something of an invitation. This would be his fate if he continued siding with Shah Rukh. The year after the death of Timur, more failures would follow his offspring. Sultan Khalil lost control over a large portion of land between the Aral and Caspian Seas. Not to Shah Rukh, but to a tribal coalition of all things. If someone didn't unify the rest of the Timurid realm soon, then the many enemies of Timur would continue picking apart what remained of his empire. In 1407, Shah Rukh would have to deal with a similar problem. A rebellion had broken out in the city of Astorbad. This, unlike Sultan Khalil, was contained and put down. The leader of this rebellion fled to Pir Muhammad for shelter, likely persuading him to join his revolt. As a sign of loyalty, Pir sent the rebel to Shah Rukh. In the following year, Khalil's power would be further and drastically weakened. In the west, Kara Yusuf was continuously defeating Timurid garrisons with ease. To stem the black sheep wave, Mirhan Shah was still in the west. The decisive confrontation for control of western Persia would occur in 1408. At the Battle of Sardar, Kara Yusuf sent the son of Timur running in defeat. While Mirhan Shah did escape, he would soon be caught and executed by a subordinate of Kar Yusuf. His head would be placed on a spike and presented to the city of Tabriz. This induced the Timurid garrison to surrender, and after this his head would be sent to his brother, Shah Rukh. With western Persia gone, a large portion of suitable farmland had went with it, leaving Samarkand particularly vulnerable. Soon after, a famine broke out in the city. Many died, and the ones unlucky enough to survive blamed Sultan Khalil for their suffering. Khalil's popularity started to tank in the capital, and in the rest of his lands. While he had angered the common folk through their stomach, the nobility was furious with his wife. She had much influence over Khalil and began appointing members of the non-noble class to high points in the court. With everyone at his throat, Sultan Khalil was left with little option other than to leave Samarkand 
and surrender to Shah Rukh. Shah Rukh marched unopposed to Samarkand and was welcomed into the city. He had won a civil war without fighting a decisive battle. As his name suggested, he waited patiently for his time to swap spots with the king piece in a masterful move. Instead of executing his nephew and rival, Shah Rukh spared Khalil. He even named him as the governor of Ray, bordering Kar Yusuf, in a similar position his father was in just before his death. Shah Rukh then named his scholarly and multilingual eldest son as the governor of Samarkand and the Crown Lands, the infamous Uluq Beg. While his story is a notable one, we will get to it after Shah Rukh's. As Khalil adopted the titles of Timur, Shah Rukh took the Islamic titles of Sultan in the Persian Padshah, even though the first part of his name means king in Persian. In this, Shah Rukh continued the long-standing tradition where the people who conquer Iran suddenly become as Persianized as their subjects. It happened to practically all the steppe empires of Persia, the Parthians, Mongols, and now the Timurids. After four years of war, Shah Rukh was finally at the head of a smaller, but much sturdier Timurid empire. But just as Shah Rukh had nursed the ailing empire back to health, one of his most important relatives and governors died, Pir Muhammad. He would be assassinated in a plot orchestrated by his own military. Seeing this, his brother, Iskander, fled to the safety of Shiraz. And during a long journey, while wearing only a shirt, a hat, and a single boot. After streaking his way across eastern Persia, Iskander gained the favor of Shiraz and struck back at his brother's assassins, killing them and reclaiming Pir Muhammad's portion of the empire. While Pir Muhammad was largely an independent ruler, Iskander would take this on to another level, proclaiming himself as a sultan. The calm Shah Rukh did not react much at this, however. Unlike Sultan Khalil, Iskander had the popularity needed to live true to his moniker. He, like Uluq Beg, was a true scholar. He appointed many learned men to his court. On top of this, he also garnered support from the religious leaders he also invited. Even still, he issued many buildings and ordered historical and scientific works be written. With stability restored, Shah Rukh sat back comfortably on his throne, but there was still a storm brewing in the west, under the will of Kara Yusuf. In 1410, he took another powerful step by betraying his closest ally, the somehow still alive Ahmad Jalayir. Although he was defeated plenty by Timur, the great nomad could never capture him and he remained a thorn in his side. Kari Yusuf did what he could not, finally capturing Ahmad Jalayir and executing him. His land now fell under the domain of the growing Kara Kanulu. Where Shah Rukh's rival fell, only a year later a previous enemy would meet an unfortunate end. Sultan Khalil committed suicide alongside his wife likely shameful that he could not hold on to the most powerful empire in the Middle East. In that same year, the Eastern Chagatai Khanate finally made a move against the Timurids, who were originally carved out of the Western Chagatai Khanate. The Chagatai army began a march on Samarkand. They were, however, not strong enough to face their Western counterpart and were eventually submitted to a peace treaty. Now, at peace for some time, Shah Rukh intended to finally face Kara Yusuf. He invited his vassal lords to campaign. All but one answered his summons. Iskander, the self-styled Sultan of Timurid Fars, declined Shah Rukh's invitation. To make matters worse, he also began minting his own coin something only an independent ruler had the right to do. 
Shah Rukh, the ever-patient man, could not let this go unchallenged, and turned his army meant for Kar Yusuf on to Sultan Iskander. By the next year, 1414, Shah Rukh captured his opponent's capital of Esfahan, which just so happened to be the site of one of Timur's most brutal massacres. Unlike him, Shah Rukh spared the city, only after capturing another upstart nephew. Iskander's lands were therefore split between his two remaining brothers, Rustam and Baikara. Shah Rukh gave the elder brother, Rustam, his rebellious sibling, to do with what he wished. So he blinded him before handing him over to Baikara. To cement his rightful claim, Shah Rukh used to play Iskander most assuredly would have used on him if he had won the Civil War. He ordered a detailed history be written about Iskander's rebellion, written by the victor. The drama with his nephews was not yet over, however. Iskander the Blind convinced his caretaker brother, Baikara, to start his own rebellion. Shah Rukh ordered Rustam to march with him against another brother. He accepted and by December of 1415, Baikara surrendered. He was spared and exiled, but Iskander was nowhere to be seen. The blinded rebel had escaped, and somehow managed to go some ways north before being discovered by a group of Turkish nomads. After being handed to Shah Rukh, he gave him straight back to Rustam, who, this time, executed him. Having proven his loyalty yet again, Rustam was promoted to the role of Supreme Army Commander. In this position, he would remain until his own death ten years later. Following this, Shah Rukh decided to suspend his campaign against Kari Yusuf for the foreseeable future. He was a patient man, and it was clear that his empire needed more time to recover from its many civil wars. But this peace could not last forever with the warlike descendants of Timur surrounding him. In 1418, the Gawar Shad Mosque was completed, built by and named after Shah Rukh's beloved wife. It's safe to say that it is a masterpiece, the inside being a kaleidoscope of geometric patterns and the outside sharing a Turkic-Persian influence, a true representation of the Timurid dynasty. During these peaceful days, Shah Rukh set his focus on developing peaceful relations across Eurasia. The most notorious of these embassies left Samarkand in 1419, on its way to Beijing. Again, in contrast to Timur, Shah Rukh would see the Ming Dynasty of China as an ally and valuable trading partner. After all, it was where the Silk Road started, a trade route that passed straight through Timurid lands. Shah Rukh entrusted his diplomat, Gayath al Din, with leading the envoy to China. Gayath kept a road diary which survives today as a Marco Polo like story. The caravan took the northern route along the Silk Road, passing through the homeland of their Turkic ancestors, picking up many merchants as they went. At the envoy's maximum, it reached 500 men. Once arriving in China, Giath mentions the Chinese Christians. He revels on this, knowing that the Christian domains lay far to the west. In 1420, the Timurid diplomat arrived in the brand new Ming capital of Beijing, home to one of the most powerful rulers of China, the Yang Li Emperor. After meeting the emperor and presenting him with many gifts, Yang Li decided to let the diplomat stay in his court. During this time, they were under the care of a Turkish man who held an important advisory role. His competence as a linguist was something to behold, knowing Mongolian, Turkish, Arabic, as well as multiple Chinese dialects. The highlights of Gyoth's trip to China included impressive acrobatic performances almost daily, huge amounts of food at feasts fit to feed hundreds, as well as a tour of the many gardens sprinkled throughout the forbidden city of the emperor. He also tells about China's booming economy and incredibly fast courier systems. 
Not only this, but he also gets a glimpse at the young Li Emperor's darker side. Watching as he committed men to a more brutal torture than Timur could ever think to commit. Death by a thousand cuts. After five well-spent months in Beijing, relations were finally restored, and Giath departed to make his long journey home. He arrived in Samarkand in 1422, after more than three years of travel. With relations recovered with the Ming, let's take a wider look at the geopolitical position of the restored Timurid Empire. In the east, the Delhi Sultanate had not yet recovered from Timur's brutal sacking. Shah Rukh also expanded trade relations with coastal India. To the north, the Golden Horde was no longer a vassal, but still not much of a threat. The Chagatai Khanate, who had previously attacked the Timurids, was still held in a truce since then, and despite their proximity to Samarkand, they still presented a little threat to Shah Rukh. To the south, the Timurids had control of the Persian Gulf and a slice of Arabia through their vassal of Hormuz. But to the west, Kari Yusuf was still at large, and with an ally, the Mamluks of Egypt. This was the only outside threat left for Shah Rukh to subdue. After five years of patient peace, he decided it was due time to avenge his brother's killer. In 1420, Shah Rukh conquered a small state sandwiched in between the two Turkic superpowers. This was a preemptive move to cover his back before setting off on his defining campaign. Following this, Shah Rukh concluded a military alliance with his enemy's backyard rival, the Ak Kanulu, or the White Sheep Turkomans. Soon after the Timurids invaded Kara Kanulu proper, its ruler, Kara Yusuf, gathered his army to defeat the Timurids once again. He was nearing the Timurid host when he suddenly fell sick and died. One of the most anticlimactic ends to a great rivalry and a skilled general. In his place, the Kar Kanulu would fall apart just as the Timurid Empire had after the death of its founder. Four of Kara Yusuf's sons would claim the throne and throw the land into chaotic civil war. Now, playing by Yusuf's own rules, the Kar Kanulu were easily picked apart and mostly conquered by 1422. Having mostly subdued the black sheep Turkomans, Shah Rukh appointed a governor over his new Azeri and Armenian lands before returning home. Where Timur may have plundered and looted his way to a surefire victory, Shah Rukh spared civilians and stationed garrisons to protect his gains. There is only two ways people will let you rule over them, and that is if they fear you or they love you. The brothers, still fighting one another over scraps, made time to focus on their withdrawn enemy. The eldest of the four sons, Ispand, reclaimed the interior portion of the Kar Knulu, but he didn't have time to conquer Azerbaijan before the third, oldest brother appeared on his doorstep. Kara Iskander had already proclaimed himself Sultan. Now he was here to reassert his jurisdiction over the land his brother had just conquered in Iraq. After a battle, Kara Iskander prevailed, but showed mercy on the man who had the best claim to their ancestral seat of power. With this, the Kara Empire was nearly restored, with the big exception of Azerbaijan, which was one of their strongholds. Kara Iskander even managed to defeat the coalition as a whole, driving the white sheep away from the land both grazed on. Despite having his army and several other Timurid hosts intact, Shah Rukh did not relaunch his invasion of the west, intent on holding Azerbaijan tightly. However, to the north, the disunited Golden Horde had unified under Batak Khan. Shah Rukh's son, Uluk Beg, was offering support to Batak Khan, hoping the north would be secured by a powerful ally yet again. But just as Takhtamish had, Batak Khan started reconquering Timurid lands, and even defeated Uluk Beg in battle. And just like him, Batak was overthrown by a civil war within years. For now, the northern border was safe, 
made dangerous, it appears, by the dabbling of Uluk Bag. In 1424, Rustam, Timur's loyal nephew, died. And just when they needed him, yet again a threat emerged from the Chagatai. Uluk Beg himself defeated the opposing Khan. With that, he finally achieved the goal of protecting the shortest route to Samarkand. A religious movement started to overtake the empire. In order of Sufi Islam, Harufism was threatening to destroy the Timurid Empire from within. In a story not so dissimilar from Jesus and the Roman Empire, Timur killed the founder of Harufism, a theological scholar named Astarbadi, leaving the Harufis as an anti-state religion. Timur was so bloodthirsty, a whole Sufi sect became popular because of it. Shah Rukh, in what is becoming a theme, did nothing about it. Harufism only grew further, and was even practiced by some of the many assorted scholars of Samarkand many of which were only there because Timur had burned their city to the ground. This wasn't a problem for Shah Rukh, until it very suddenly became one. A man disguised in a shepherd's fur coat catches his first glimpse of Shah Rukh as he exits the mosque. He approaches him slowly, as if he was only passing by. Suddenly he grabbed for his knife, and lunged at Shah Rukh. This man's name was Ahmed Lur, a previous commander under the notorious Ahmad Jaliyir. Even from the grave, the Jaliyirid was attacking the Timurids. Shah Rukh attempted to defend himself, but was stabbed two times before the royal guard could seize him. Shah Rukh recovered from his wounds in due time, but the attack had finally made the complacent Sultan act. After connecting a meddler to the Harufis and the Jaliyurids, it soon became clear that the Timurid enemies could use this religion as a unifying force. If it was Timur they were mad at, then Shah Rukh was going to remind them what his half of the Prince of Destruction looked like. Shah Rukh began a purging of the Harufis. Knowing it had become commonplace among his scholars, he ordered interrogations and exiled many of Islam's brightest minds. He even went as far as interrogating his artistically minded son. No, not Uluk Beg, but the thirdborn, Baisangar, who was just as capable an artist as his elder brother was a scientist. He was arrested and found not to have any involvement in Harufism. After this, most Harufis were forced to leave the empire. The Sufi order died out soon after, in the 15th century. Having purged his intellectuals, Shah Rukh ceased pressing the issue much farther. This was likely the cruelest thing Shah Rukh did during his reign, which is something to say considering his ancestry. Three years later, in 1429, Kara Iskander was becoming increasingly confident and began attacking the Timurids outright yet again. Shah Rukh gathered an army of over 100,000 men and sent it to deal with the Black Sheep. When the two armies clashed, it appeared that a long day of fighting was ahead of the survivors. And then, Iskander's youngest brother, Abu Sayyid, defected to the Timurid army mid-battle, causing Iskander to quickly retreat all the way to the far west of his realm. His plans falling into place, Shah Rukh consolidated his role over much of Karakanulu, then handed it directly to Abu Sayyid, who would become his new pawn. And then Shah Rukh made the same mistake twice and concluded the campaign before capturing Sultan Iskander. Not even a year following this grand campaign, Kara Iskander's ally, the Mamluks, finally came out of hiding, taking away Shah Rukh's probe in the area. As before, Iskander defeated his brother. However, this time he executed Abu Sayyid before retaking the rest of his sultanate. 
the western border for over 20 years has still not been tamed and presented a looming disaster. Unlike before, Kara Iskander began to pick on the Timurid ruler of Azerbaijan, the Shirvan Shah. The black sheep invaded and raided, but could not take the mountain strongholds. Shah Rukh again did nothing. He waited for some reason. Perhaps he was about to restart his campaign, and that's when his son, Baisungar, fell ill. He would die young in 1433. In the following year, Shah Rukh would invade the Kar Kanulu for the third time in his reign. The same course of actions would follow. Iskander retreated, Shah Rukh conquered most of the land, and then gave it to Iskander's brother. This time, it was Jahan Shah's turn. As was at the beginning of the war, another son of Shah Rukh died unexpectedly, but thankfully not the Uluk Beg. As expected, Kara Iskander returned, but this time he was repulsed and retreated. That's when an old enemy reared its head toward them, the Ak Kanulu. In exchange for helping the Timurids, the Ak Kanulu were promised protection from their Mamluk subjugators, as well as from their black sheep counterparts. An army led by one of Shah Rukh's sons, an Ak Kanulu ruler, Kara Uluk, ambushed Kara Iskander and his dwindling number of followers. The long-term and 79-year-old Timurid ally was finally planning a lasting revenge on the Black Sheep Turkomans. However, his plans would be dashed as the surprised and outnumbered Kara Iskander managed to push the coalition army away. Denying his own safety, Kara Yuluk charged himself and his bodyguard into the fray of the battle. He was after one thing, the head of his rival. Unfortunately, he didn't get time before he himself was cut down. Kari Yuluk can be considered the founder of the Akkanulu state. His 57-year reign ensured the smooth transition from step tribe to a settled and well-established society. The Akkanulu had only just begun. While Kari Yuluk was in his heroic last stand, Shah Rukh's son made a run for it and safely made it back. At least three sons hadn't died after or before a battle with Kara Iskander. With nowhere left to fight, Iskander left his lands and made way to the Ottoman Empire, which had somehow managed to recover from the devastation and civil war left over from Timur's conquest. Sultan Murad II declined any invitation to support Kara Iskander, knowing better than to help a Timurid enemy after Ankara. He even denied him entrance into his empire. After a few days' rest, Iskander was on the road, a sultan without a sultanate. With what remained of his army, he returned to the Kara Kanulu, en route to slay another Timurid aligned brother. Outnumbered, he was defeated by his older brother, Jahan Shah. With nowhere left to go and a handful of loyal men behind him, Kara Iskander attempted to flee to Egypt, home to a once powerful empire. One night, seeing the delusional father become the Ahmad Jalir of his day, Iskander's own son murdered him. After four campaigns, Shah Rukh's armies had finally defeated their most dangerous neighbor, and in the process gained a bulwark of an alliance. During the long reign of Jahan Shah, the last of Kara Yusuf's children to hold power, he would expand the Kara Knulu to its largest extent and enjoy a flicker of a golden age. In the life of Shah Rukh, however, this would never be an issue. With no one left to defeat, Shah Rukh did what he did best. Absolutely nothing. The Timurid Empire entered a golden age of peace. For ten whole years, Shah Rukh would be the just ruler of a realm which never knew peace. Sure, the occasional rebellion popped up here and there, but this would be the safest the Timurid Empire would ever be. While Shah Rukh wasn't the most militarily minded ruler, his strength was drawn from his lack of enemies. 
he never really suddenly attacked a nation unless he had to. Where Shah Rukh excelled was in development, diplomacy, and delegation of power. Shah Rukh can be considered the second founder of the Timurid state. He truly settled the nomadic empire that he had inherited. He adopted Persian customs along with his subjects, and when he wasn't persecuting Harufiism, scholars continued to visit Samarkand as a hub of learning, led by his astronomy master's son, Uluq Beg. His mostly passive manner ensured that the might makes right of the step would not apply in his empire. He even went as far as abandoning the Yargu court, a traditional Turkish assembly that would investigate all sort of matters such as treason. Shah Rukh calls this agency tyrannical and corrupted before dissolving it. In place of steppe tradition, Shah Rukh, who was said to be a devout Muslim, adopted more Sharia law, thereby matching the religion of the majority of his subjects. Shah Rukh was not so much a direct ruler, as he was a great appointer of competent people at the core of his empire. His sons were well learned and some of them experienced generals. His wife took secular and humanitarian matters into her hands. Her mosque alone stands as a great achievement, along with being a true friend of Shah Rukh. First was Giyath al-Din who served as Shah Rukh's vizier for 30 years and after that became an advisor to a few of Shah Rukh's grandsons. As the head of the military after Rastam, a man named Jalal Uddin was a useful warrior for over 35 years. Becoming close to Shah Rukh's militaristically minded sons as their mentor. Most importantly, for 43 years, the entirety of Shah Rukh's reign there was Amir Alika, the head of tax and the treasury. Perhaps Shah Rukh's closest confidant in the most important matter of statehood. Through these three men, Shah Rukh had his trifecta of skilled and loyal followers advising him on every move. As the peaceful days continued, Shah Rukh became increasingly and noticeably ill in 1444. Despite this, the good days remained. Two years later, the now exhausted and gravely sick Shah Rukh learned about a rebellion in Esfahan. The leader was one of his own grandsons, a son of Baisangar. And just when he thought these days were over, one of his direct descendants made a bid for the throne. Although he was in a dreadful state, Shah Rukh had enough strength to go on campaign and re-establish the unity of his empire for Uluq Beg. He retook Esfahan with relative ease, and in a manner more like Timur, Shah Rukh executed many nobles of the city. This out-of-character action can be explained by what happened shortly after. Just like Timur, Shah Rukh died a few months shy of his 70th birthday. Shah Rukh sometimes receives a reputation as being a weak ruler, but I'd say he was just extremely calculating with every move he made on the board. He's one of those rulers who actually seems to be a mostly good guy, which is very rare in this time and place. Over the course of his 42 year reign, Shah Rukh nearly did nothing but when he did take initiative, he rarely made a mistake. Besides campaigning against Kara Iskander four times. Where Timur was a conqueror, Shah Rukh, as his name suggests, was a true ruler and state builder. He would be succeeded by his son, whose many scientific achievements we will discuss very soon. If you'd like to support this stoic historian, feel free to do so on Patreon for as little as a dollar a month. And join Derek Clark, Savak Leo Nazarian, Taj Guilford, Nick Mate Voicean, Lazarus Dykos, and Dave J. Or become a YouTube channel member like Derek Clark again, Donald Vincent, and what? Why? Thank you guys again for supporting the channel. I really appreciate it.